Yeah. And you try to do it the right way. Right. So one, one thing you'll hear is Protestants will say, we have no choice but to protest when the church, uh, you know, dogmatically defines the Marian dogma, so to speak. That's one thing my Protestant buddies will say. They'll say, you know, we disagree with this. You know, I, I can't in, in good conscience get on board with this, which is exactly what Martin Luther was saying. I can't in good conscience recant the things that I'm saying. But fundamentally what he's saying there is, I know better than the church. I'm wiser than the church. And as Catholics, we believe that Christ established a body on earth and that he has promised to guide that, that body throughout history. And when we really believe that, when, when something happens in the church, this, this is something I think we were just talking about the other day, is... Luther felt like he was the savior. <laughs> you know, like he was the one that God was going to use and call to reform the church and, and bring it back. But it's God's church, you know? Um, and, and, and so uh, that's something you hear a lot of times. But ultimately what he was saying is, I trust in myself more than I trust in the body of Christ, in the church. And ultimately as Catholics, in Jesus, because it's, it's, it's his church. Um, and so I can sympathize with what Protestants are saying when they say, well, when the church anathematizes this and anathematizes this, but this is the gospel, <laughs> they're anathematizing the gospel. That's what you'll hear Protestants say today. What is that word? Anathematize. So, Excuse. yeah, it basically excommunicated. A lot of Protestants think it means that you're damned to hell. You know, like it's a very visceral term. That's not what it means. Now, obviously, if you're excommunicated from the body of Christ, that's, that's concerning. You should be very much concerned about the state of your soul. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, anathematize. It, and you see that in ecumenical councils, and where it comes from is um, in the book of Acts. So you see multiple times St. Paul says, you know, watch out for false teachers. Um, but then also in the Council of Jerusalem, you know, when, when they got together to decide do Christians need to be circumcised or not. Um, so, yeah, does that, does that answer your question or kind of, you know, because what, what they're saying when they say, well, the Catholic Church anathematized the gospel, they're saying that I know what the gospel is better than the church, and I'm going to trust in my own understanding better than the church. Um, so... It's, it's important to frame it for what it really is and not <laughs> pretend that, you know, that it's something else, so to speak. On what she was saying of, well, he tried to go through the system and, uh, and it didn't work. Um, well, Padre Pio also was told to quit essentially practicing as a priest, and he obeyed, and now is considered one of the greatest saints we've ever had. Exactly. So... And that's something that Father always likes to talk about. When you look at the lives of the saints, one thing they all have in common is humility. Well, that, that's what I'm sitting here thinking about. The, the, the idea, when, when the humanism idea came, it probably wasn't the first time. That, that idea has levels. And, and we are... Again, advancing to a new level of humanism, yes. it seems. Yes. And and that can bring with it great destruction. Yes. Yep. And, and you're spot on, Mike, and that's why I wanted to include, you know, the philosophy of humanism, because it definitely helps you understand, you know, where these guys were at. How, how we could have gotten yeah. in that place. Yeah. Do you have some, Marcus? Yeah, and also the... What Luther did is totally unique. So in that Council of Nicaea, when they addressed Arianism, you had the bishop Arian uh, or Arius, who, you know, he tried to do things his version of the, of the reform. You know that Christ wasn't divine, right? They tried to settle that in the council, and when the council and the church said, "No, you're wrong," he said, "Well, okay, well, me and the guys who think I'm right." We're going to keep on yeah. on the side, you know, 
they, it's somewhat of a separation of the church is what, is what that calls um, until that kind of yeah. died out and then eventually you know it's still alive today yeah you know, some faith religions, but. yeah and and that's something for me that was really big in, in my converting to the church because the one thing that you see when you study early church history and you study the heretical movements a lot of times there's this character that these guys were just evil <laughs> They were just the bad guys, and they were just troublemakers and up to no good. That's not, there were some who were like that, but for the most part, these guys thought they were doing what was right. They thought they knew what was best. And that's the one thing that you have in common with all the heretical movements and the heretics. You know, we said the one thing that you have in common with all the saints is humility. Well, the one thing that all the heretics in church history have is the exact opposite of that. They were so sure that they were correct. They thought they knew better than the church. And this is why for me, some of, some of us have talked about right now in the church, there's internal strife between like traditional Catholics and modern Catholics. For me, the thing that I go back to is you're either Catholic or you aren't. <laughs> you know, you really, you really are, you know, what it means to be Catholic is, is to believe that Christ instituted a church and has promised that His Holy Spirit will guide that church and you trust in that. You don't trust in the Pope, you trust in the church. Now God, you know, the Pope's important, you know, <clears throat> don't get me wrong, don't misunderstand me, but you're not trusting in any one individual, you're trusting in God. You're trusting in the Holy Spirit. And so that's the one thing that you can see in common with all the, with all the heretics. They thought they knew best. The Reformation, one of the good things that is done, as I am from India, I know is that the uh, Bible is translated into many languages. It is uh, they who took the initiative, and uh, even Catholics, we were using their translation, the Bible, and the uh, uh, something good, it went faster. The evangelization went faster. Now the church took up that Bible and added the books that are rejected by them. So we have the Catholic Bible also. So something good God has done through this division also. Yeah. Because there were people who were thinking that they are doing the right thing. Yeah. And that's a, that's a good point and segment into our next section because uh, we're running out of time here. So I'll kind of expedite. But one thing that I want to point out is we've talked about relativism. We talked about relativism last class. And one thing for me, it seems very obvious that relativism is the fruit of the Protestant Reformation, fundamentally. And a lot of Protestants will, will scoff at that. But the argument that I make is, as a Catholic, I believe that God revealed himself in Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ founded a church and promise that the Holy Spirit will guide that church throughout all ages to the end of time, uh, like Jesus says. And so I believe that there are certain things that I can know about God and be certain of. I can know them objectively. They're objectively true. You know, the divinity of Jesus Christ, the Holy Trinity. Um, you know, there are many things that I can have certainty, and I can say that's objective truth. And if someone said, well, how do you know that's true? I, can, I, I have some ammunition there. I've got the church. I've got church tradition. I've got the scriptures, of course. Um, but there's an objective way of knowing certain things. Whereas as a Protestant, ultimately, if you follow that ideology down to its root, it's subjectivism. You know, the best you can say is, well, this is my interpretation. This is what I think is right. And this is why I think there are so many people today who... They're not Christian because there's so much disagreement amongst churches. They say, well, why would I be Christian? You Christians can't even agree amongst yourselves. You know? So how can I be certain that, that, that Jesus Christ was who he says he was and God does exist in the way you think if you Christians can't even agree upon basic things? And I sympathize with those people. Um, my dad is one of those people. You know, that's a big stumbling block for him. And I think rightfully so. And I think that's one of the reasons why one of Christ's wishes before he was crucified and ascended was unity. He really stressed the importance of unity amongst Christian believers. And for me as a Protestant, 
I used to see, see those scripture verses where Jesus want, wants unity, and I used to say, well, Jesus, if this is what you want, surely you would have given us a way to achieve it. Because he knows that we're knuckleheads, you know, that we can mess things up and fight and disagree. And so it, it always just, that was something that was always on my mind, you know. Christ wanted unity. It's really important to know the nature of Christ and the nature of God. Surely he would have given us a way to do that. Um, and that's why for me, when I discovered the magisterium and what the church taught about the magisterium, it was like a light bulb went off. Because that is a mechanism, as well as the Pope. You know, that is a mechanism where unity is achievable and has actually sustained throughout history. Um, that's one thing that's interesting about the Catholic Church from just a historical standpoint. There is no other institution that has lasted as long as it has. Not even talking, like, religiously. Think about if in, in 2,000 years Amazon was still around. That would be, like, unheard of, right? Um, so that was something else. You have to go back to the fall man. Satan doesn't want unity. Right. He puts discord in yes. us from the very beginning, twisting the truth to make you go the other direction. Exactly. And then when you're at each other, you're not going to look for God. Yeah. And that's why uh, St. Paul, when he's talking about false teachers, he says, those who twist the scriptures. And I just... It, it's so prophetic, you know? And that's why I think one of the main things the Reformers were saying was sola scriptura. Because if you can get away with the authority of the church, if you can get away with the authority of the Pope, and you can just be you and your Bible, St. Paul warns us that that's the, the, the number one tool for a false teacher. It's going to be scripture. And when I read about the heretical movements in church history, all the heretics were well-versed in the Bible. And you know who else was well-versed in the scriptures? Satan. Exactly. Satan was well versed. Wouldn't that be a good read uh, if C.S. Lewis could write in modern times about how the devil works? Yeah. Yeah. I know what I read. Yep. So, one thing to keep in mind is we all know what the Bible says, but what does it mean? You know? That's, that's one thing to keep in mind. It's so important. Um, and that's what, what I always say to my Protestant brothers, you know, when I'm discussing with them is. We both have our Bibles open. We're reading the same. I could see what it says. You know, just repeating that over and over is not going to change anything. But what does it mean? And I think if someone is humble and has a humility, like Father Bijou says, they'll be on, honest enough to say, well, like the Ethiopian eunuch, when he's reading the scriptures and he says, and, you know, the apostle says, do you know what you got there? <laughs> you know, I, I think that's kind of funny. You know, he. he he doesn't know who he is, and he says, you know what you got there? And he says, how can I, unless someone teaches me? And I think that may be the answer to your question about Catholics in, in the Bible. You know, there's a humility that's required to say, yes, I want to be in deep in the scriptures, but I also need assistance. I also need church tradition. I need the magisterium. I need, um, you know, I need to be guided so that way I don't fall off into error. So... So anything else? Would you got we got ten more minutes? Would you guys rather we go through the Reformation real quick, or would you rather just do ten minutes of? We've covered a lot tonight. Would you rather just do ten minutes and then we can review the Reformation at the beginning of next class? What do you guys think? Let's do let's do Q and A, and then I'll do. The summary of the Counter-Reformation, which is what we were talking about earlier with Mike. He was saying, surely all these guys were saying this. Surely there were you know, people who stood up in the church, and there were. Um, and it's, it's really awesome to learn about the Counter-Reformation. So why don't, instead of, I don't want to rush over that. Why don't we just cover that at the beginning of next class? And then the last 10 minutes here, we'll just do open discussion, open Q&A um, about everything we've covered tonight. I know it's a lot. And, you know, if it's too much, please let me know. Um, but this stuff is so important, it's really hard to chop stuff off. You know, when I'm making these outlines, and, and it, it's really hard for me to just scratch something off because it's all, it's all really important in my opinion. So.
Yeah. Yeah. And I would like to have a mature way. Yeah. <laughs> a non argumentative way. Yeah. Of having those maybe those maybe it would be a good idea because next session I believe we're covering Sola Scriptura. So maybe it would be because that's what Marcus and I have been that's why be, me and him both grin because that's what we've been talking about all week is the canon. Um, okay. Yeah, so maybe I'll include that with Sola Scriptura. But what, what she's talking about is, as you all know, Catholics. You know, Catholic and Protestant Bibles look a little bit different. Um, so we have what's called the Deuterocanonical books, um, the additional books in the Old Testament, um, whereas Protestants, Martin Luther removed the Deuterocanonical books. So that was one of the things he did when he made these Bibles. And when, like Father said, when they were translating these Bibles, they chopped them up a little bit. <laughs> and he tried to get rid of some of that New Testament. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so real quick, just to give you a brief summary, and this, is, this stuff's brand new to me. This is kind of one of my side things where I'm at, and this is what Marks and I have been talking about. But have you ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Yeah. So I've heard that a million times, but I've never actually looked into it until Marcus sent me a video by John Ber Dr. John Bergsma the other day. And I, I'm sure you could tell by how late I was texting you, but I was up late last night. I went on a, <laughs> you know, I was just fascinated by the Dead Sea Scrolls. So... Like, like she said, Martin Luther was looking at the Jews of the current time, and he was saying, well, they don't have these deuterocanonical books. You know, their Torah doesn't have the deuterocanonical books. Therefore, the early Jews didn't have the deuterocanonical books. Therefore, the church must have added them. So there was very much a, an agreement upon, amongst theologians, you know, up until the 1940s that the deuterocanonicals, you know, there was some ambiguity about that. The Dead Sea Scrolls were an archaeological find where you had the Sadducees, the Pharisees, but then you also had a third group of, of, of Jewish sect called the uh, Essenes. And what the Dead Sea Scroll were, were, were the Essenes stored biblical text. And they were in Hebrew, they were in, was it Greek? Aramaic, Aramaic like multiple languages. It, I mean, it's an incredible archaeological find, you know, not even just church, you know, archaeology archaeological, but just in general. But one thing that was so profound about them is they found a lot of the deuterocanonical books in these scrolls. And so at the very least, it proves that the Jews at the time of Jesus didn't have an agreed upon canon. And this is really important. This is really important because when you're talking to a Protestant about the canon and the scriptures, you'll say, well, how do you even know what the Bible is? The church gave it to you. You know, that's what, that's what we would say as Catholics. And the Protestants, you know, the smart ones, will say, okay, so the church was founded here, and the church is how we get the Bible, so how did we get the Old Testament? Because <laughs> the Old Testament had been around for a long time before, you know, Jesus allegedly founded the church um, in Matthew 16. It's a good point. You know, it's kind of a head-scratcher. Um, but the counter to that is they had the Old Testament, but they didn't have an agreed-upon canon. You know, today we have the New Testament, and our New Te Testament is exactly the same as Protestants. There's no difference. There's a set canon. We agree upon it. Whereas the Jews at the time of Jesus didn't have a set canon. It was, it was, that's why you had different sects. That's one of the reasons why you had the Pharisees. One of the reasons you had the Sadducees. They had different texts. The counter to that, <laughs> you know, playing ping pong like we talked about, um, is that when you look at Jesus' dialogue with the Pharisees, he always pre it, there seems to be a presupposition that they agree upon what canon is. So a Protestant will counter that and say, well, Jesus doesn't say, well, you have this book, you have that book. He says, have you not read? And the counter to that, the best one in my opinion is, if I'm talking to a Protestant, and we're trying to debate different doctrines, I'm not going to pull up the catechism and say, well, this is why this is true, because the catechism says so. Because he doesn't recognize the catechism. It would be a waste of time. It would be foolish for me to um, attempt to do that. It would be much better for me to pull out my Bible and say, yeah, let's talk about the papacy. Let's, let's look at Matthew. Let's look, you know, because that's what he knows. So that's where I'm going to meet him at. I'm going to meet him where he's at. 
And, and the Catholic understanding is when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, he's meeting them where they're at. So that would be the counter to that. So that's a, that's a good one. Like I said, maybe we can include the canon uh, in Sola Scriptura. Yeah. Also, if, uh, if it's the case that the Catholic Church uh, if, if mistakenly added the wrong books to our canon, that all Christianity pretty much was in error for about 1,500 years. Yeah. And, then, and this is what we, we talked about this idea last week, which is what's more likely, what's more reasonable. The idea that Jesus establishes a church and, and te- teaches them and, you know, gives them the tools they need to be able to go throughout history, you know, proper. Or is it more likely that Jesus does all that and then doesn't equip the church to do that and then the church fails and then 1,500, you know, 1500 years some guy comes up and, and reclaims the church. What's more likely? You know, when you put it that way, what's more reasonable to think? And for me, I don't know. It just, it just doesn't make sense. You know, it, it's called the great apostasy, which is what we talked about last week. And this is something the Mormons teach as well. Um, so it's a good point. Anyone else before we finish up? spent some time talking about the nature of the Eucharist. Uh, maybe if there's time, you could give us a bit of a deeper dive. The nature of what? I'm sorry. The, I could... the Eucharist. Okay, yeah. So you could give us a deeper dive into what the subtleties of the catechism. Yeah. Maybe Aquinas. Or yeah, absolutely. Compare and contrast with what the uh, uh, Luther would uh, yes. think of. Yes. Yep. And I think that's a, that's a, great, that's a great point. But I think it's session five or six we're going to get into the sacraments, and uh, we'll really dive into that um, and comparing and contrasting, like you said. It's a, it's a good point. Anyone else? Thank you. <laughs> it's a lot, but it, it, you know, I just feel more, a little bit more equipped. Now, could I tell that to somebody else? Probably not. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. yeah, we'll get there. Like I said, the main, the main takeaway today, if you take anything away, is the difference between what we now know as the early Protestant reformers and the saints. It's the main, if you take anything away, take that away. You can be right in the wrong way. You can be right in the wrong way. Humility versus pride. Humility versus pride, exactly. It's really good. So... Thank you, guys. Um, At the very bottom of the outlines, or the back page, so I included two QR codes. And what you do is you just pull up your camera and you scan it. But there's two videos on there that are really good, that are a little bit more in-depth and cover what we discussed. The first one is a video on the Reformation from a Protestant perspective that I thought was pretty good. Obviously, I disagree with some of the things he said. And... Um, one thing you'll notice when it, is when he talks about the early reformers, he fails to mention all the people in the church who were <laughs> reforming from the inside. You know, it kind of conveniently leaves that out. But uh, I, I put a Protestant perspective, but then also I put a video on there from the Catholic perspective by Dr. Tim Gray, who's a professor and theologian out at uh, the Augustine Institute. That video is fantastic. It's incredible. And I've watched... Just about all the main videos on the Reformation you can find. But that video, if, if you watched anything, watch that one. Because he does an incredible job of, of, of teaching it. Um, and then I put underneath there Proverbs 18:17 Because I could see where someone would say, why would you include you know, the Protestant perspective of the Reformation? And so I put on there, he who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. Um, so like Mike said, I don't want this to be a... Catholic fishbowl where we just, you know, when we're being unfair and, and, and biased towards the Protestants. So want to be fair and, and equitable because um, that's what we would want. So, all right, guys. Like I said, next week we're going to talk about Sola Scriptura, uh, authority, and maybe we'll get into the canon a little bit. So see you next week. Yeah. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen.
St. Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Yes, a good point. The bubonic plague, that's, that's well, a good one. I just saw that it just randomly popped up two times in a row from, from uh, like random, random contacts.